He was an electronic music pioneer who appeared on a Beatles album and whose only string quartet features parts for helicopters, possibly because he claimed to be from space. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Karlheinz Stockhausen. Stockhausen was born in 1928 in the western part of Germany, in the village of Murdrath, in a large manor that many mistook for a castle. When he was still very young, his musically inclined mother suffered a severe mental breakdown and was sent into an asylum, only to be slaughtered by the Nazis when he was 13. At this point, the young Karl Heinz had been getting music lessons for six years and had had a stepmother, his old housekeeper, for three years. As a 16-year-old, he was drafted into the Wehrmacht and served in various hospitals, seeing firsthand the carnage of the front. His father was also conscripted, and he went missing in action towards the end of the war, never to be heard from again. All of which is to say that by the time Stockhausen was 18, he had already wrestled with some serious demons. Putting together links between the horrors he witnessed in his formative years, and the nature of his music, and his philosophy, and his comments, which proved to be quite controversial later in life, is hard to discern. Regardless, after the war, Stockhausen decided to continue his musical studies in Cologne, but this was not as a composer. Rather, it was as a student of piano performance and of pedagogy, which is probably why he was such a persuasive author and speaker on the subject for the rest of his life. Once he started seriously writing music in 1950, his third year at the conservatory, he got in touch with various composers such as Frank Martin, Darius Miod, and Olivier Massian, and in order to study with the latter two, he moved to Paris. While he found Miod unconvincing as a composition teacher, he very much enjoyed his time with Messiaen. By this point, Stockhausen already started a niche on the very cutting edge of the avant-garde, the nascent world of electronic music. Only a few studios existed, and they were full of very expensive analog technology. We are still about two decades away from the synthesizer as we have come to know it. It took a very long time, and a very long and enormously exhausting process for any composer wishing to work in the electronic field to go from envisioning something to actually realizing it. Stockhausen left Paris once again for Cologne because he was tapped to be the assistant in Cologne's brand new electronic music studio, and after a decade took over as its sole director. His initial appointment was on the back of the Concrete Etude, and his time in Cologne led to such groundbreaking achievements as the electronic studies and the fantastically disturbing Gesang der Junglinge, which takes electronic sounds and mixes them with an edited recording of a boy singing various lines from the Book of Daniel. What set Stockhausen apart? Well, for one thing, it was his rigorous application of serialist ideas into various aspects of music that had theretofore not seen any serialist procedures. These were invented by Schoenberg, refined by Webern, and then known to him through the work of Olivier Massian, who was one of the first composers to start applying the principles of the 12-tone series to musical parameters other than pitch. In Massian's case, it was in the field of rhythm. Not only did Stockhausen know about this through Messiaen himself, but he was also just one of the first generation of composers to really become deeply fascinated by the abstract architecture inherent in the serialist system. He thought very carefully about the various criteria he had for music, and of electronic music in particular, which he regarded as a logical next step in the evolution of the Western tradition. His work is not just totally electronic, and in fact, it's probably best to characterize his work as resting at the intersection between the acoustic and the electronic. He was equally at home in both fields. An apparent contradiction in Stockhausen is that, while he was obsessed with having one single definitive version of a work, as can be seen in the nature of his electronic scores, which by definition are just one single definitive version, he was also just as obsessed with the idea of scoring for performers in ways that encouraged wildly different interpretations. He found ways of including serialist principles that also included the quirks of various performers or of performers in a group. An example of this is that he wrote his wind quintet Zeitmasse, which uses a bunch of different timescales superimposed upon one another, at the same time as he was in the electronic studio writing Gesang der Junglinge. That this is possible is because he was obsessed with the passage of time and how time ordered itself in music. In fact, you can say that an underlying obsession with the passage of time is a through-line throughout most, if not all, of his mature works. 
The three orchestra extravaganza gruppen applied the principle of ordered superimposed durational structures to various instrumental choirs placed in specific locations around the audience. Another outgrowth in the mid to late 1950s was something that he called polyvalent form, which allowed for a performer to take one of many paths through the piece as prescribed by the composer himself. This also led to something called variable form, which was a form that was determined in part by the subjective durational structures found in the interpretation of a given piece, slowing down or speeding up of a certain tempo or things like grace notes, etc., would become not just embellishments, but rather something that became very important to the form. Many of these forms were initially conceived and expounded upon in a series he called Klavierstücke, which just means piano pieces. Stockhausen wrote 29 Klavierstücke between 1952 and 2003, and while I don't really find them very convincing to listen to on account of the fact that I don't think that the kinds of forms he was working with work as well with the limited timbres of the piano. You can't talk about Stockhausen's music without at least mentioning this phenomenal series of pieces. One can seriously study what Stockhausen was doing in various periods over the course of his mature compositional career through what he did in the Klavierstücke. We don't really need to look at other pieces because these pieces span the length of his career, and they are a microcosm of whatever he was working with in that particular era. 1959's Klavierstück Elf, that's 11, uses something he called open form, which is strikingly similar to something that John Cage might have written. And in this, Stockhausen composes out a series of moments, and then it's up to the performer to decide what order these will come in. This is an outgrowth of pointillism, which uses a note-to-note -note style of composition without much regard for the overall formal structure. But instead of going from note to note, he's instead going from composed out moment to other composed out moment. Much can be said, and indeed much ink can and has been spilled over each and every one of Stockhausen's works. And there are a lot of them, considering their enormous complexity and the fact that he spent so much time thinking about what he was going to do before he actually wrote something. It's amazing that a composer like that, with such an arduous pre-compositional and compositional process, was able to produce so much music. This is especially true when you look at how long it took him to realize electronic parts, and how many of his pieces actually utilize electronics. Not every single one of his did, as I mentioned, but the amount of time it took someone to realize even the most basic thing in a studio back then is mind-boggling. His dedication to his craft is just... wow. If, at the end of the day, he decided that he didn't like something, there was no opportunity to hop back into the logic session and edit and splice to your heart's content. There was a lot of significant reworking, sometimes from the ground up, which involved a process that would drive a lesser man mad. Some say that he was already mad, but believe me, we're going to get to the controversial stuff. Just hold on a second. Some of the more interesting projects to emerge from the 1960s were his series of pieces entitled Microphony and his piece Fresco from 1969. His first piece in the Microphony series delved into a micro world of sound by having a bunch of performers with audio equipment gather around and play a single tam tam with various filters, with various mallets and beaters and everyday objects in order to extract sounds that sounded unearthly from what's generally considered to be an orchestral one-trick pony. Fresco, on the other hand, was intended for practically unrehearsed performance as background music in three distinct areas over the course of an entire evening. Got that? Well, the musicians didn't, and they thought Stockhausen was a nutcase. There's a case to be made there, but all Stockhausen wanted to do was create a totally immersive Stockhausen experience. You see, there was an entire Stockhausen evening in the Beethoven Hall in Bonn, and he wanted anyone coming to that concert and going between Stockhausen pieces in these different concert halls to be able to continue their immersive Stockhausen experience by experiencing the bits and pieces of fresco along the way. This might just be a funny little music history footnote, if not for the fact that the musicians hated it so much to the point that they pretty much openly revolted. They were unable to get out of playing what they considered to be the antithesis of music, and so they paid lip service to the score before goofing around, playing their own things, or just consuming a conspicuous amount of alcohol. Needless to say, it did not go very well. Still, we must give Stockhausen credit for being one of the major 20th century figures involved in revitalizing the idea of spatialization, 
that music in space was just as much of an important factor as the timbre and the duration and the dynamics and all sorts of other considerations when writing music. The apotheosis of spatialization was in the work of the late Renaissance and early Baroque composer Giovanni Gabrielli, and this finally petered out with the work of Heinrich Schutz in the mid-1600s, who was Gabrielli's most famous pupil. It was only reintroduced as a technique a little bit in the symphonies of Gustav Mahler, who by his own admission wanted to put entire worlds into his work. Stockhausen was one of the major 20th century European figures to bring it back into the musical landscape as a functional technique. One through line through Stockhausen's career was his constant embrace of new directions to take serialism, new slants and directions through which he could derive some form of compositional superstructure. The 1970s saw a great expansion of this with something he called formula composition. You could not hear the musical processes in the end result of a serialist piece, and Stockhausen sought to correct this by creating a system that was similar to serialism, but one where you could actually hear the musical processes going on at the same time. The formula would just be a melodic idea, or a collection of them, that was embellished and expanded and then played in several different scales of time, sometimes all at the same time. Lest you think that this is straightforward, make no mistake. The formula often reaches enormous levels of complexity and density. This allows Stockhausen to use the same basic melodic formula over in different versions of the same piece. But the different versions would not just simply be transpositions or a few different changes of register. They would be different pieces in that some of the notes were different, but the process by which he determined them was the same from piece to piece. A great example of this would be his piece In Freundschaft, which was originally a piece for solo clarinet, but was then transformed into a piece for flute and then eventually over a dozen other solo instruments, all of which were officially sanctioned by Stockhausen himself because he used his own formula to rework them for individual different instruments. They were not merely transpositions. This focus on formula composition, and I suppose more broadly of Stockhausen's laser-like focus on various distillations of serialism, left a bad taste in more than a few people's mouths. Sir Thomas Beecham said that he had never conducted Stockhausen, but he had trodden in some, and Georgie Ligeti, who had turned his back on serialism when the serialists got a little too navel-gazy for his tastes, said that Stockhausen's process was, well, planification. The minimalist composer Philip Glass quipped that Stockhausen acolytes defended their favorite composer by claiming that his pieces were much better than they sounded. Even Pierre Boulez, the serialist's serialist, said that Stockhausen was very much enclosed in himself. Yet for all of these criticisms, they are basically criticizing the music for what it is. Stockhausen's music cannot exist without this very cerebral, very complex pre-planning of what he's going to do. Stockhausen's music cannot exist without predetermined structures, and take it from me, every composer goes through pre-compositional planning, it's just part of the process. Even Ligeti himself was not immune to this planification, although his criticism was more broad in that he didn't feel as if Stockhausen composed enough, he just focused on the pre-compositional structures, which was basically his criticism of most of the serialists. No one was immune to this planification, but Stockhausen used it on such a deeply thorough scale that it was off-putting to some. It was in the late 1970s that Stockhausen began work on his magnum opus, Licht, a seven-opera cycle based on the days of the week vis-a-vis -vis the archetypes of the Archangel Michael, Eve of Adam and Eve fame, and Lucifer, because you gotta have a bad guy. This was a big process, and it took him until 2003 to finish it, and it encompassed, well, everything. All traditions and characters and languages were on the table, especially those of his own invention. Each day had an associated color, which meant that each opera had an associated color, and throughout much of the rest of his life, he would wear color-coded sweaters that aligned with these colors for every day of the week. He had the big picture in his head, but he knew that even his enormous experience would not allow him to simply trudge through and write the operas in the order in which the days actually come. He knew that he needed to start with the very simple ones and work up to the larger and larger operas. This process reached its apex in Mittwoch, that's Wednesday for those of you keeping score at home, the penultimate opera written. And the third scene of Mittwoch is a standalone piece called the Helicopter String Quartet. 
Each member is lifted in a separate helicopter, and their amplified playing is mixed with the sound of the rotors at the mixing desk. Yes, it's part of an opera. Why? I don't know. For what it's worth, he at least realized that the resulting performance could not be indoors, and he instructed that the performance be, in our modern terms, live-streamed in to whatever concert hall this was being held in. How accommodating! In all, the cycle takes nearly 30 hours to perform, and possesses neither clear beginning nor clear ending. It was the long-term culmination of the various compositional techniques he'd used throughout the course of his career. It was as if all of his previous work was merely a preparation for the ultimate spectacle, far outstripping even the most extravagant Wagner score for the title of most all-encompassing Gesamtkunstwerk. As if this wasn't grandiose enough, the formulae used in the composition of Licht ended up being used in other auxiliary compositions which don't have any actual connection to the story of the opera cycle, but use the formula in a way that they are actually still connected. After finally completing Licht, Stockhausen decided that, you know what, I'm going to write another cycle, based on the hours of the day. Fortunately, these were not operas, these were rather pieces of chamber music, and he managed to complete 21 out of the planned 24 hours. This came to a screeching halt when he died of sudden heart failure in December 2007, at the age of 79. Stockhausen married twice and had six children, four of whom went into music. Most notably, these included his sons Marcus, a trumpeter, and Simon, a saxophonist, and Karl Heinz wrote music specifically for his sons to play. Stockhausen's cultural impact was wide, very rare for a composer of his era. The Beatles hid his kinda creepy-looking portrait on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band, and were clearly influenced in the years before their breakup by some of his music. A surprising number of composers working on the rock and roll avant-garde saw Stockhausen as an influential new voice, or at the very least an interesting one. Within the Beatles, it was Paul McCartney who took credit for discovering Stockhausen through Gesang der Junglinge. Once John Lennon heard some Stockhausen, the influence made it onto the White Album at the very least. Though his writings on electronic music were myriad and broad and fascinating, and his theories extremely influential in his heyday, he brought along a level of controversy late in his life that did not annihilate but certainly put the brakes on continued promulgation of his music, which would have been very hard to do anyway considering that they're often very difficult to play. These comments included, most infamously, that 9-11 was the greatest work of art in history. A later qualification tried to append the caveat that it was Satan's work of art, but the damage had already been done. Family members estranged themselves from him, and he lost prestige in the musical and more broadly cultural world. Only the true believers were left hitched to his cause. As well they should have, because like even if he was thinking it, who says that? His estranged sister, who did not have any contact with Stockhausen for at least the last 36 years of his life, if not more, said that her brother lived in a different region from normal thinking people, which is a very nice thing to say considering that A, they were estranged for such a long time, and B, that Stockhausen actually banned his children from so much as even talking to her, and there's no clear reason why he did this. Stockhausen, by any objective standards, had an extremely rough go of it in his childhood, and it's likely that this affected him for the rest of his life. One can only look at his worldview. It was very dichotomous. It was black and white, good versus evil, with him or against him. If you were with him, he loved you. If you were against him, then he threw you out. He saw himself as a figure in a grand universal battle between good and evil, and he was somehow at its epicenter. While his compositional theories were as profound as ever, he claimed to have been educated near Sirius, the star system, about nine light years that way. In his New York Times obituary, Paul Griffiths wrote that he presented himself as the receiver of messages about a spiritual drama being played out in the cosmos. There's also his alleged polygamy, but we're not going to get into that. Without a doubt, Stockhausen was one of the major figures of the 20th century. His scores contain a lot of unusual notational practices, up to and including the use of color, and his theoretical writings were a jolt in the arm of how all post-war composers viewed the nature of music itself. This included such concepts as a scale of tempos, 
various extrapolations of his underlying theories of form and structure, as well as lectures on the formula composition techniques that he pioneered in the 1970s. Going into Stockhausen's theories and beginning to apply them to his work and to the works of his contemporaries is far beyond the scope of a mere biography. His work contains multitudes in every sense of the term, and yet dissemination of them has been stunted by the kinds of comments he made late in his life. Everyone from the aforementioned Beatles, to all of the academics who are working in electronic music, to figures like Bjork and Jerry Garcia, all credit Stockhausen as a major influence. Stockhausen once said that when we hear sounds, we are no longer the same, that we are transformed by them, and that this is highlighted and even more profound when we listen to music, which was organized sound. I suppose that, in the end, he just wanted to take all of us on a journey to Sirius. Mm -hmm.